In this lecture, we will continue our conversation about agriculture, and we will focus in on organic agriculture compared to conventional agriculture and the relative benefits and drawbacks of these approaches. This is an organic farm in the background. I will start today by talking about what we mean by organic farming. So we'll give a brief description, and then we will very briefly talk about the history of organic farming. Next, we will compare strategies for both um, adding nutrients or fertilizing, and also for um, controlling pests in organic and conventional settings. And we will end today by talking about the evolving meaning of the term organic and also how organic agriculture has started to favor very large-scale agriculture instead of small-scale farms where organic techniques started. Before we go further, we should talk a little bit about what organic farming means. Organic farming is agriculture that relies on natural sources for soil nutrients and either natural chemicals or natural methods for pest control. When we get a little bit further in, we'll talk about exactly what techniques are used for nutrients and pest control. So that's what organic farming is. We can also think of organic farming as being any farming that excludes or strictly limits the use of some techniques. These would include the use of manufactured fertilizer, so fertilizer from synthetic sources, the use of manufactured or synthetic pesticides, and the term pesticide is going to include things that kill other plants, those specifically are herbicides, um, chemicals that kill insects, those are insecticides, and chemicals that kill fungi, those are fungicides. Synthetic forms of any of those are excluded in organic agriculture. Organic also excludes the use of plant growth regulators. These would be plant hormones, and it excludes the use of genetically modified organisms. This, by the way, is from the um, EU Directorate for Agriculture. We'll talk briefly about the history of organic farming. Before the 20th century, so prior to the 1900s, all farming was basically organic. This was because synthetic pesticides and fertilizer had not been invented yet. Then during um, the 1940s and after especially, we increasingly developed um, first synthetic fertilizers and then synthetic pesticides. So these were the new non-organic elements of farming. Around this time, the term organic farming came into use. This was coined by Lord Northbourne in a book called Look to the Land, and this was in 1940, again, right around the time when other approaches were starting to be invented. Some major events in the U.S. are listed below. The first one is that J.L. Rodale um, started to publish um, both books and magazines, and there was a magazine that had various titles um, that involved organic growing. This was around the 1950s. So this really started to popularize the term. Then in the 1960s, so this was a period of substantial social transition, a scientist named Rachel Carson published a book called Silent Spring. And in that book, Rachel Carson highlighted the problems with the popular pesticides at the time. And um, one thing that she talked about was the fact that those pesticides were killing birds and hence that we would not have bird calls in the morning and our spring times would be silent. This book um, generated a lot of publicity and really was the wake up call for a lot of people um, in the American environmental movement. And the picture of the book cover is here. In the 1970s, we had the start of more formalized organic farming or at least formalized organic regulations and this was with the California Certified Organic Farmers. And so they could apply a label saying that members of this group were using organic techniques. We then had a couple of decades where organic farming was around, 
and you could find products that were labeled as organic. Um, there were also various different certifications offered, but there wasn't any single uniform certification throughout the country. Finally, in the early 2000s, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, formally started the National Organic Program, and this had specific rules that all farmers in the United States had to follow if they were going to be allowed to use the term organic. So this really took what was a initially a popular movement and institutionalized it into a federal program. That's a general history of organic farming. Let's move on and compare approaches in organic farming to approaches in conventional farming. We'll start by looking at how organic and conventional systems manage nutrients in the soil and hence soil fertility. On the left-hand column, we have approaches used in organic agriculture. On the right, conventional approaches. In organic farming, um, nutrients are managed through several techniques. One is crop rotation. So crop rotation refers to when one crop is grown in one season, and then the next year, typically, some other crop is grown instead. Because different crops have different nutrient needs, then they allow one nutrient to get replenished while other nutrients are drawn down. Additionally, if crop rotation include, includes legumes, remember that legumes are nitrogen fixing. And so while legumes are planted, the amount of nitrogen in the soil can be increased. And then in subsequent seasons, other things that need that nitrogen can be planted. That's crop rotation. Second, we have the use of green manure. This basically refers to when cover crops, such as grasses or sometimes legumes, are planted, allowed to grow, and then plowed under. And as they decompose, their nutrients become available. This is again an especially useful technique if the cover crop is a legume, because again, legumes have nitrogen-fixing bacteria. The third approach is adding compost. So this is decayed um, either animal matter or animal waste, or it can be decayed vegetable matter. But either way, that matter is allowed to decompose for a period of time. And then what remains is spread on the field. As it continues to break down, it provides nutrients um, that had been stored in the biological material. Finally, organic agriculture can use natural compounds. So this can include um, phosphate from rock or mineral sources of phosphate. It can include other products like green sand, sulfur, and lime, which will either add various nutrients or help to manage the pH of the soil. Conventional agriculture relies on multiple techniques. I should point out that all techniques used in organic agriculture sometimes are also used in conventional agriculture. So it's not unusual to see crop rotation happen. And um, the use of cover crops that get plowed under is also common in conventional agriculture. And using things like sulfur and lime is again common. So the techniques in the organic side can be listed under conventional too. What we're mostly looking at here are additional techniques not used in organic that are used in conventional. The big one here for soil fertility is the use of artificial fertilizers. And the artificial fertilizer is going to come from ammonia, which is captured or created um, using a very energy intensive process. The energy will come from fossil fuels such as natural gas. This basically produces um, fixed nitrogen, but instead of using bacteria to do it, it is using um, industrial processes. And the benefit to this is that we can get a lot of nitrogen made easily available. The disadvantage to this is that it requires a lot of energy. For weed control, we'll see something similar. Where there are many techniques that are used for organic farming, those same techniques can be used in conventional farming, and then there's some additional ones too. So for organic farming, one way that weeds are controlled is crop rotation. 
crops can be planted that deter weeds in some season, and then other crops that are more susceptible to weeds can be planted in subsequent years. Organic weed control can involve tilling and cultivating. This involves disturbing the soil to um, kill, to pull weeds out or to kill their roots, or to expose weed seeds, get them up to the surface, allow them to germinate, and then later bury them. Um, this can be done with hand weeding, but this could also be done even in an organic system with large machinery. Mowing is a technique. Plastic sheeting can be used. There's some different variants on it, but this is a plastic mulch shown in the photograph here. This is plastic that one literally pokes holes in and then plants plants into the plastic. The plastic pre prevents weeds from growing in the vicinity of the plants. There are flame weeders that does what it sounds like. It burns the plants and thermal weeders, which heat the plants to kill them. In both cases, this would be killing the weeds. And then mulching, we've already talked about plastic mulch, but we could also use a natural mulch, like a thick layer of leaf debris, for example, to keep down weeds. In conventional agriculture, Tilling and cultivation are extremely common. We already talked about that for organic. The new thing here is there can also be synthetic herbicides. So this means herbicides that are created in the laboratory and that are toxic to plants. This can be done in a couple of ways. They could just be sprayed on plants um, away from the crop plants, such that the crop plants are not harmed or crop plants that have been genetically engineered to be resistant to the herbicides can be planted. And the herbicides then can get sprayed over all of the plants. The crop plants will be unaffected and the weeds will be killed. We'll continue thinking about pest control, thinking about how um, insects and fungus, fungi can be controlled. In organic, we still have crop rotation as one technique. We can also have interplanting, which is pictured here. This is where one kind of plant is interspersed with one or more other kinds of plants. The idea is that because the same kinds of insects tend not to feed on all plant types, if plants are planted among one another, then this makes it harder for insects to find their intended target, and it can help limit pest outbreaks. It is a fallacy to say that organic agriculture does not use pesticides. Instead, what's true is that organic agriculture uses naturally occurring pesticides. This can include a toxin produced by a particular bacteria. This is Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt. And so the, um, the toxin is called Bt toxin. We also have rhodanone, which is um, uh, uh, harvested from plants, and pyrethrums, which are harvested from chrysanthemum and relatives. Because these are naturally produced, they're allowed to be used in organic agriculture, even though they are toxic chemicals. Um, Bt in particular is not um, harmful, at least in normal doses, to humans, which is why one reason that it is favored um, as a pest control method. In conventional agriculture, we have a variety of possible ways of controlling pests. We again have synthetic pesticides, much like synthetic herbicides, that can be sprayed onto the plants. Genetically modified plants that are resistant to pests can be planted. These can be plants that are engineered to make their own Bt toxin, for example. And then all of these other methods that we talked about for organic farming can also be used. For example, crop rotation would be common, and interplanting is another possible method. Organic agriculture has changed substantially since its inception. Over the last 70 years now, organic agriculture has evolved from a small-scale, sort of naturally focused 
um, system into a much larger scale system that is more focused on adhering to a set of rules and also being economically profitable. So the initial goals of organic agriculture included the following. First, there were sort of a set of farming practices. So um, things that we've already talked about, about not using conventional uh, fertilizers or pesticides and using other alternative techniques to add fertility and control pests. Then there was a philosophy of eating locally. This referred to supporting farms in one's immediate vicinity and, if possible, knowing the person who was growing the food. There was a general philosophy that was implicit in early organic agriculture. This was that agriculture should be natural. As such, it should be anti-industrial. Um, so keeping factories as far from the process as possible. And there was a feeling that small-scale agriculture was um, perhaps morally superior or at least more desirable than large-scale farms. This has evolved over time due to some uh, pressures and current practices now are more focused on adhering to a set of rules, so making sure that practices that are not outlawed are avoided, or rather, making sure that outlawed practices are avoided, but anything that is not against the rules is implicitly considered okay. And the emphasis for um, at least the marketing of organic agriculture is selling the consumer the idea that they can minimize perceived health risks from exposure to synthetic inputs in genetic engineering if they instead buy organic food. So the consumer is told that organic is safer. Notice I'm not actually saying here that organic is safer. This is much more um, perception than it necessarily is a reality. Whether or not it's a reality is something that is uh, contested and a matter of debate. Let's talk about what today the rules are for calling a product organic. As we've already said, in the United States, a seller can only use the term organic if they have organic certification from the USDA. In practice, um, I think that the way this still works is that there are private companies that do the certification, but they have to do it according to USDA rules. To be certified as USDA organic, the product has to be produced through approved methods, and the methods that they include say that they have to foster the cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. In practice, those are fairly amorphous. And so in practice, what the certification is really about is avoiding prohibited products and practices. Those prohibited products and practices are as follows. Growers cannot use synthetic fertilizers. They cannot use artificial pesticides, although they can use approved natural pesticides. They cannot use sewage sludge, which is very high in nutrients, but there's a risk, or at least a perceived risk, that it can be high in undesirable things like heavy metals and other chemical contaminants. They cannot use irradiation, um, and they cannot use genetically engineered plants, again, um, partly because of a general philosophy and partly because there's a perception that these are riskier for health. Um, whether they are or not, again, is a matter of debate. The organic product market has grown markedly over time. This shows the millions of hectares of organic agricultural land from 1999 up through about 2016, it looks like, maybe 2017. And you can see that it's gone from around 11 million acres, almost five times as much um, by 2017. So we're now talking about over 50 million acres in organic cultivation. 
over time, there has been a shift in the scale of farms that use organic techniques. When the approach was started, this was only small-scale farms that grew organic produce. It was deemed not commercially viable for larger farms. But that has now changed dramatically, and large farms now dominate the market for organic foods. So why is this? One reason for this is that there's a high cost of compliance with organic standards. So organic crops require that before the crop is grown, there's a crop management plan in place that has been approved by the, um, the company that is monitoring. And so this requires that the farmer do things like state what techniques will be used, what chemicals will be used, where those chemicals will be procured from, um, and under what conditions they would be applied. And of course, those chemicals, if they were used, would have to be on the list of approved natural chemicals. It requires, certification requires having an accredited company come to inspect the farm and to provide the paperwork. And this, of course, is going to cost money. If it costs a similar amount for a small and large farm, then it's an easier cost to absorb for the larger one than the smaller one. So many small farms, especially sort of weekend farmers, are not able to afford the cost of having accreditation, even if they are using organic techniques. There's then also the general uh, problem or the general reality that there are economies of scale in agriculture. What this means is that the costs of production per acre go down the more acres that are being farmed. Think an example would be that if a farmer needs a tractor, a tractor is a fixed cost that costs basically the same amount regardless of whether that farmer is farming one, five, or ten acres. Therefore, the farmer with ten acres can spread that cost a, that cost across all ten acres, while a farmer with only one acre would have to pay for that tractor with that one acre's production. So because of the benefit of being able to spread the cost across more acres, larger farms have lower costs and are better able to make money. This is true in organic agriculture. It is similarly true in conventional agriculture. So in both cases, we are seeing a loss of small farms and increasingly farms being aggregated into a few very large farms with fewer and fewer owners. We've referred already to debates between um, those in favor of organic farming and those in favor of conventional farming. We're going to summarize the arguments here and then do some reading about them in a little bit more depth. So here are some of the debates. On the pro-organic side, people argue that organic farming is a more sustainable option than conventional farming. It needs fewer inputs, especially fewer chemical inputs, and it maintains soil fertility without using fossil fuels to make um, nitrogen fertilizer. So that's the pro-organic argument. The pro-conventional argument contends that organic farming is not sustainable because it does not produce enough food per acre. And they argue that there's not enough cow manure, manure and other sources of compost to be able to use organic techniques on a large scale. They say that the world population demand for food cannot be met unless we use fossil fuels to make um, artificial fertilizers. The pro-organic side says that organic foods are healthier. The argument here um, is one made by the author of your textbook, and it's an intuitive argument. Pesticides are chemicals that are designed to, especially insecticides, to harm insects or at least deter them. And because we are animals also, we are related to insects, anything that harms an insect is also likely to have harmful effects on humans. So because organic food lacks artificial pesticides and other artificial chemicals like fertilizers, 
that could be harmful to us, this means that organic food is less likely to be harmful. It is also argued that organic farming techniques simply produces higher nutritional value in the food, so there would be more protein or more mineral nutrients in organic food. The conventional side argues that health risks have been exaggerated, so they say that maybe there's a little bit of pesticide residue on conventional food, but not enough to actually cause harm. They also argue that many more people die from poor nutrition than from being exposed to trace amounts of pesticides. So if we can simply grow more food by using pesticides, we can provide more nutrition, and hence we can actually decrease mortality worldwide by using conventional agriculture. Um, the pro-conventional side also argues that, in fact, conventional food is just as nutritious as organic food. So that's under debate. I'm going to add that in here. Let's go back to the organic side. The organic side argues that organic production is better for the environment because pesticides are not used and so insects are not harmed. Um, pesticides don't run off into surface water and groundwater that humans and other organisms can use um, for uh, habitat or for drinking. And for a variety of other reasons that you can read about, they argue that um, there is less environmental harm with organic farming. I think that's again an intuitive argument. But the conventional side counters that organic farming is actually worse for the environment. The basic argument goes that because you get less food produced per acre in an organic farm, you need more land in your organic farming system than in the conventional farming system to feed the same number of people. But if you need more land, that means converting land from natural uh, um, habitats into agricultural land in order to farm. So the argument goes that you would be better off if you used fertilizers and pesticides and as a result could grow more crops in a smaller amount of space and leave more space for nature. The organic side says that it's better to have local economies because local economies tend to uh, support more people or to keep money circulating um, within the community. The conventional side says this argument, they might agree with it or not agree with this argument, but they say it doesn't really matter because now organic farming is done on a large scale. Organic crops are shipped both around the United States and even around the world. So if you go to Whole Foods today, for example, you can probably find produce like frozen broccoli that was grown in Mexico, Chile, or China. And so they say that calling organic local farming is no longer accurate. These debates I'm not going to try to resolve for you, but I will provide you some additional reading that will help you come up with your own opinion about it. Some final thoughts. First, the benefits of organic and conventional agriculture are hotly contested, as we've just referred to. This debate has both environmental and economic implications because um, both farming systems have effects on the environment. Whichever is worse, um, they're a little bit different from each other. And it has huge economic implications for the companies that own organic farms versus those who own conventional farms. And similarly, the stores that sell a lot of organic produce compared to the stores that sell more conventional produce. So convincing the public can make a big difference to both of these. Next, let's point out that integrated pest management. This refers to farming techniques that try to minimize environmental harms by minimizing the amount of pesticides used. So the idea here is that pesticides are not necessarily avoided, but they are only used when absolutely necessary. Um, these techniques are used increasingly in conventional agriculture. 
The problem is that it's hard to market. It's very easy for a company to say, we follow the organic standards, and that's something the consumer understands. But when the company says we use integrated pest management, the consumer doesn't have a way to evaluate whether that company is very far towards the organic side and almost never using pesticides, or really if it's using pesticides all the time. And so even though this is probably a good idea, it's hard to sell the consumer on a product that's not fully organic, but that does use IPM. And finally, I'll point out that you and I as consumers have to choose whether to buy organic or conventional produce with very little information to make that choice. So there's all of these hotly contested claims, but we know very little about the specifics of the environmental harms or the nutrients or the pesticide residues when we are choosing between the two. That makes our decisions um, ill-informed and hence not necessarily the best, but it's also hard for us to do much about that without having more information. In your upcoming assignment, I'm going to ask you to read a little bit about the two options and then to justify which option you think is better in some situations.